That's our little promo video on our new study that we begin today. Starting today, we are launching into the study of the book of Acts uh, called Spirit Empowered Mission. I think we have the next slide up. Let me see. Spirit Empowered Mission. Um, we go through books of the Bible, mainly here chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We figured the Holy Spirit wrote the book that way. We should preach it that way. So we go through books, and we'll going through the book of Acts probably over the next year together. It's also a way to keep us from going along bunny trails, like really deep, dark bunny trails. We're all wearing the same colored sneakers and drinking Kool-Aid together. Or well, we find ourselves maybe in a bunk somewhere in Mississippi with Bob Wire, no TV, and 14 wives. So what we like to do is go through books of the Bible, and then what we do is we, we look at the interpretation of Scripture, what did it mean to the original audience in the original day, what did the writer try to say, and what was he trying to point to, and what was God communicating, and then we find that out, we bring it into today, and then we try to, with the firm foundation of what God is saying to them on how we apply it to our lives. So it kind of keeps them safe from running around and doing some crazy things. Um, so we're in the book of Acts together. I want to encourage you to be reading through that book, maybe, you know, once a week, uh, 20, uh, you know, 28 chapters, not that long. If you got it on your uh, app on your phone, you can listen to it while you're having coffee. But be in the book of Acts together. We're going to break in community groups throughout the week. We're going to be studying it again together. So it's going to be a, hopefully a great time. I'm excited about it. Um, you know, just watching God work and hoping and praying that he'll work among us as well. So I'm going to pray, then dismiss the kids, and we'll get started together. Father, thank you for the written, written record of the book of Acts. Father, thank you that you're not done. And thank you, Father, that you have given us the accurate uh, recorded message for us today. Uh, Father, we pray that as your people, we would gather together around Jesus and his mission. That, Father, we would be light and salt to this community, to our neighborhoods, to our schoolmates, to our, to our friends, to our co-workers, so that we can join you as you are looking to seek and save those who are perishing. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word, as we begin this study together, Father, you would get all the glory and that you would forgive sins, that you would uh, give mercy to those who need mercy, Lord. And we pray, Holy Spirit, empower us to live on the mission with Jesus as he seeks and saves the lost. We love you. We pray with expectation, knowing that you will meet us here and that, Father, you would get glory. We would get joy. In Jesus' good name, we pray. Amen. So kids are dismissed, and what I'd like to do, if you've never been here during book studies, what I'd like to do on the first sermon, if you're a history buff or you like details, this is your day. If you don't like history and you don't like details, we'll wake you up in about a half an hour because that's where we're going um, because it's important to look at the background of a book before we launch into a verse-by-verse -verse study of it. So what I want to do is I would like to do is introduce you to the author. The author is a man by the name of Dr. Luke. Colossians 4 tells us that he is a physician. He wrote the book of Acts, okay? He is the only New Testament writer that is not a Jew. He is a Gentile, which means he is not Jewish, so turn with me, if we can, not to the book of Acts, but to his gospel, the gospel according to Luke, is where we will begin. Because in the study of Acts, we've got to understand the gospel according to Luke. We'll spend some time there. Because when the Bible was written, it was written as one book, two volumes. The gospel according to Luke and Acts. One book. Two volumes. Very important to understand. So Luke, in his prologue, chapter 1, verse 1, functions as well as a prologue into Acts. Because again, it's one book, two volumes. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as these, those, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely. In other words, there's been those who've written other things, but I, I'm here writing to you now the things that, that you need to know. Verse 3, it seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account, 
Gospel according to Luke, an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty, okay, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So what he's saying is, I'm not one of the original 12, but what you need to know, Theophilus, is that I carefully investigated and wrote down like, like a good detective, all the things that took place during the ministry, during the teaching, during the miracles, during the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he's writing this down for Theophilus and for all of us to give us a, an accurate and an orderly account. So Luke is saying, like, look, I carefully researched this. I, I, I interviewed people. I, I sat with others. I, I listened to those who were walking with Jesus. And I wrote these things down for you, Theophilus. Of course, being led, the Bible says, by the Holy Spirit. Luke is saying that me being a doctor have now investigated and now writing things down so that you can be certain of things that have taken place. Now, even though Luke is considered, if you know anything about the, the, the gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're called, three of the gospels are called synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic meaning similar. John is kind of separate because he's, he's writing his own thing, but still one account, one gospel, one Jesus. And what you'll find in the gospel according to Luke, because he investigated and he, he, you know, he went to extremes to talk with people, is you'll find things that you won't find even in the other synoptic gospels, like... In the Gospel according to Luke, you will see that Luke is very intimate with Mary in the sense of knowing Mary's broken heart over the life and death of Jesus. And you see into the heart of Mary a little bit more than the other Gospel accounts because Luke sat down with Mary and got the scoop firsthand. It also says in the Gospel according to Luke that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter tried to take the head off one of the soldiers, but only caught his ear, and the ear fell to the ground, only Dr. Luke, the physician, records for us that actually Jesus picked up the ear and healed him. A physician would pick that up. Thank goodness that Tyson wasn't around at the moment. But he would love that detail. I, I was watching uh, recently, I think two weeks ago, I was watching a news report, and they were, and what caught my eye, and I don't usually watch this news network, if you get what I mean, but what caught my eye was, and if you don't, that's okay, uh, what caught my eye was that they were talking and were taking a, a consensus, and what they were doing was connecting those with high RQ, IQs, the intelligent ones, and those of people of faith who believe in Jesus. And of course, it wasn't very, uh, it was a disparaging uh, report, and they were trying to claim that the uneducated people are, are the people of faith. And I'm sure some of you have heard that, right? All you Christians, you kind of just leave your brain at the door. You know, you don't really reason anything. You haven't really checked out anything. You kind of just, you know, you're, you're, you're a bunch of uneducated and you can't even count. Well, that's not completely true. That is not true. Were there everyday blue-collar people involved in spreading of the gospel? Yes. But Luke is an affluent man. He's a doctor. He was not uneducated. He was very educated. In fact, scholars would tell you that the book of, of Luke and Acts was written in a very intellectual style of Greek. That he was an educated man. He was a competent man. He was an intellectual dude. He, has, he writes as someone who had formal training, not someone who had no training. So, was the church made up of poor, uneducated people? Yes. Was people made up of trained, highly intelligent people? Yes. Why? Because Jesus loves all people, all nations, all tribes, all tongues. Luke also is a doctor, and you need to know this too, who's a traveling companion of Paul. We'll see that in Acts. We'll see, we'll see uh, that the book will go from the Luke writing they and them to us and we. That Dr. Luke joins Paul on his, his missionary journeys. In fact, Paul calls him in Colossians 4, my beloved physician. In 2 Timothy verse chapter 4, Paul says, everyone has either abandoned me or they have gone on to ministries, but I alone with Luke, I'm alone with Luke. And there's almost a sense like, because he's in jail, he's got all kinds of things. He's like, 
everyone's gone, but it's just me and Luke. There's a camaraderie, I think, that forms, not only when, but when, when there's battle going on. Soldiers, firemen. Many of you know I worked in a correctional institution, and, and when it was during some really, really hard times with many riots, there was a band of people that stood together. Paul was, and t- Luke had that relationships. I mean, Paul was imprisoned a couple of times. He was beaten near death. Five times the scripture says he received 39 lashes. He was scourged on his back five times, uh, 39 lashes each. Back tore open. He was beaten with rods. Paul even got stoned on occasion. And I'm not talking about smoking a bomb and the soul of the Lord. I mean, he got his head bashed with rocks. He was shipwrecked. He was bit by a snake. If there's anyone who ever needed a doctor while he was traveling around the world, it was Paul. He needed a doctor. And that was Luke. Paul was a highly trained a highly trained and educated Pharisee. In fact, the person he's writing to, if you have in our, in our text, both Luke and Acts, is Theophilus, which means lover of God. Theophilus is probably, we don't have a lot of information, but because he calls him most excellent, many scholars, in which I agree, believe that he is some sort of Roman uh, official, because Luke only uses that term, most excellent, when he's talking to Felix in Acts 23, and Festus, who are both governors of the Roman Empire. So Theophilus was probably a dude who was intelligent, educated, and either he was a Christian or he was learning about Jesus or he's new in the faith. We don't really know. But Luke wants him to know the certainties of what is going on and what happened. And the aim is to give him a faithful account of what Jesus said, what Jesus did, and the progress of the church. The progress of the church. Turn with me to Acts 1. Okay, this is not going. Can you move the next slide for me? Please. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had, gone, had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen He presented himself alive to them after his suffering from many proofs, appearing to them before uh, during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, there are there are several themes in the book of Acts. We need to wrap our head around what is the main thrust and theme of the book of Acts. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. But the overarching theme of the whole book we just read. I don't want you to miss it. But all the book of Acts can be cons- you know, consolidated to, to, to one thing. We just, we just read it. Luke says, in my first book, Theophilus, in the gospel account, I dealt with all the things that Jesus began to do. What he began to teach until he ascended, which Luke ends with the ascension of Jesus after his resurrection. And now the gospel according to Luke ends with the ascension And now he opens up with saying that's what he began to do. And now what Luke wants to do in the book of Acts is to show, to continuously showing what Jesus is going to do. What Jesus is doing, going to do. All that he did, all that he taught, all that he began, he died, he rose, he ascended, and this is what he's doing. In fact, in your Bible, if you look, it says the Acts of the Apostles. That wasn't given to that name of that book till the second century. It wasn't written, that the title wasn't given by Luke. Again, it was one book, two volumes. And I think it can be misleading. For one thing, the Acts of the Apostles is really not about the Apostles. As you know, there were 12, okay? Really, the book of Acts covers Peter in the first portion and Paul in the second portion. So it doesn't deal with, with the Apostles. It really deals with two. Secondly, the hero of this historical count is not the apostles. It's Jesus. It's about Jesus. That's really what the story's about. It is about Jesus. So the title should read minimally, Acts of the Holy Spirit, but I think even more accurately would be Acts of Jesus the Christ. 
He said in Matthew 16, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Luke's point. Although the Holy Spirit is mentioned 50 times in the book at least, and, and, but there are 11 chapters that the Holy Spirit is not mentioned. I'm not trying to degrade or devalue the work of the, of the triune God and the work of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. But I think if we understand and we grasp that Acts is about all that Jesus began and all that Jesus is doing, we will, we will be sure not to go down that road Okay, of building a whole theology of the Holy Spirit, which some do, through the book of Acts, through exclusively through the book of Acts. It's all about what Jesus began to do and teach, and now he's completing his deeds. He, he is continuing his teaching. He is building his church just like he said he would do. In fact, in John, the gospel according to John, this is what Jesus says. He says, when he, personal pronoun, third person of the, of the Trinity, he will guide you into all truth. When the Spirit of God comes... He will guide you into all truth, for he, the Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So what Acts and what what Luke is saying is, as Jesus lived life, as Jesus ministered, showed compassion showed love, cared for people, ministered to people, taught people, healed people. All the deeds that Jesus did, he's continually doing now. Because he's not dead, he ascended, he's not, you know, absent, he rose from the grave, and Acts is a book about mission. It's about what Jesus is doing on mission. It's not history for history's sake, although it's a historical book. Okay, it's it's a book to show Theophilus and to show us that Luke believed God was accomplishing something in the world through the gospel. That's the book of Acts. Luke makes it Luke makes it very very clear very early on, in which we'll see that he understands the work of God. Beginning in Genesis three fifteen, we we studied that and we studied that together. The promise of the Messiah. Through the Old Testament, through the covenant of Abraham, his sons, the, the nation of Israel, and continuing the fulfillment of Jesus Christ, and then it continues today. You see, faithful Jews were waiting for the Messiah, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, a singular person waiting. It was communal. It was the Jewish people in a very real sense, we're waiting as a people in eager expectation that God would manifest himself when the Messiah would come and break into human history. It was a, um, it was a collective story. It was a story that they shared together. There was no mavericks in that day. We live in such a, a, such a separatist, individualistic culture. It's so hard for us to understand that. But it was a people that gathered together. A faithful Jew didn't run around creating his own reality and his own story, but knew that the people were part of what God's story, his story, what was happening. And Luke is saying the church, by the sovereign plans and purposes of God, by the hand of God, now is part of God's eternal purposes. Our stories, and you need to see this grand picture, our story, King's Chapel, is connected to something greater than just us. It's a greater story. We are identified with the person, the work, and the mission of Jesus that began thousands of years ago and continues even to this day. And as we read Acts, as you read Acts, my hope is that you hear the drum beating what God is doing, what God continues to do, Gathering with people, forgiving them of their sins, creating and empowering people to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God is here in Jesus Christ. Repent and believe in the gospel. All that Jesus came to do, he continues to do now in this age until the Father comes, until Jesus comes and the consummation of all things. That's the point of the book of Acts. That's why we exist as a church. The, books of, the book of Acts is not just about the apostles. It's not primarily about them. The book of Acts is primarily about the risen, reigning, 
ruling, enthroned Jesus. We have to see that. The key and the hero is Jesus. His power, his activity, and his plan. Okay? The second thing, and I will just skip through the next three real quick. I just want you to get a, a grasp of the book of Acts, is what they call kerygma. Okay? If you have any kind of Bible studies or if you have any reading in the book of Acts, that word's going to come up. What it means is what is being proclaimed. And scholars have looked through the book of Acts and have pulled out certain key continuing messages that the apostles of the, Old, of the New Testament and early church were preaching. There was themes that throughout the book of Acts as we study together, you will see that it's happening. You'll see things like how God was working in Jesus, how he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament that Jesus was, was the anointed, the Messiah, that he did deeds and miracles through the power of God, that he was to be crucified and rise again through, because of the eternal purposes of God, that Jesus would be exalted to the place, which we'll look at later today, later this morning, of the, of the place of the right hand of the Father, that he will come again, he will judge the world, he will restore and renew all things. These are themes, these are the kerygma of the New Testament, of the book of Acts, excuse me, of the book of Acts. The next thing the book of Acts will teach us, I think it's going to be good for us, is the apologetic uh, aspect of it. It means the defense of the faith. What you'll find in the book of Acts, and hopefully you're reading it, is that Paul confronts the culture and the beliefs in the culture with the gospel. And what he does is he looks for ways to confront the cultural aspects of Mars Hill in 17, Lystra in, ch in chapter 14, and he confronts the Gentiles and the, and the non-believers with their views with the gospel. And what he does is he tries to make a connection with that culture and points them to Jesus. And, and you may say, well, why does that really apply to us? It really does apply to us. It, it really does. In fact, I was thinking about that uh, uh, about this week. And um, I, I'm hoping through this study, I'm hoping that we begin to open our eyes to the cultural changes going on around us. And I was thinking about this week, and, um, you know, I like to go to the YMCA. I go to the one in Bethlehem, and sometimes I go to the one in the Gildeland. And as I was thinking about this week, I noticed what a different culture Gildeland has compared to Bethlehem. Even just in the gym and the different types of people that come in the gym. I'm like, you know, we're not that far away. Totally different feel, totally different culture, totally two different kinds of people. We, we, as a church, go down to the Capital City Rescue Mission. We also go, Ricky and I go to Delmar Place, which is an elderly center. You know, we have to tailor our music, and we have to tailor the message. We're not changing the gospel. But, I, you know, I, I can't take what I've said here to a bunch of people in the elderly home. They got a different view. They're, they're struggling with different things. So I, I hope that we're going to be engaging and listening and, and, and seeing people where they are. What's their struggles? What's their hopes? What's their dreams? What's their worldview? We're going to see that in the book of Acts. And finally, conciliatory. And what that means is two worlds are colliding in the book of Acts. It's actually going to be fun to watch. You got the Jewish people who hold on to the di dietary law, circumcision laws. You got, you know, you got to be a Jew first. Then you have Gentiles who are coming to faith. They're like, what are we going to do with this? You know what I mean? I mean, do, 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 do they... Do you have to come through the way of the law? Do you have to get circumcised first? You got these two colliding cultures that need reconciliation. I mean, for a Jew to have dinner and fellowship with a Gentile makes them unclean. And now they're asking questions. Am I unclean? Am I, am I, uh, do they have to come through the Moses? I mean, it seems like they've been born again. They've, they love Jesus and they came by faith. How does that work? We have the covenant with Abraham. I mean, they're outside the covenantal people, and yet they're coming by faith. And I think, hopefully, what we'll learn is how do, how do cultures collide? How can two people in the same church family who have totally different backgrounds be united around one person and one purpose, Jesus and the mission of Jesus? So we'll, we'll look at that. I, I think it's going to be a um, challenging time because you have your biases. So do I. Certain people. Maybe we've gotten past the color thing. I don't know. Maybe not. They're different than us. But they love Jesus. And that makes us about brothers and sisters in Christ. So we'll look at that. One last thing, though, I want to point out, and we're just going to look at a couple of things, and that's it. We'll call it a day, is there's a huge problem with interpreting the book of Acts. 
So we're going we're gonna to be careful. Because what people have done in the past in, in interpreting the book of Acts, they forgot and they forget to look at it through the, the, the lens of the, of the literary style. They forget that it's a book of ancient historical narratives. And whenever you study something that is, his, has, you know, is a history in, in, in its foundation, we have to be stepped back because it doesn't always, the author doesn't always tell us why things are happening. It tells us what is happening. Okay? You can read a book about war and what was going on in the ground war and a war. It doesn't necessarily tell you why it's happening. In the book of Acts, we have historical narrative. Luke doesn't always tell us whether it's normative or not. Is it that way all the time for every Christian in all ages? Being historical means it's somewhat limited in that day. We have to be careful before we bring it to the application for today. I mean, it's factual, but the focus is not always on what the purpose is, what the main truth is. Sometimes in Acts, we don't know whether we should emulate something, if it's good or bad, or maybe we should reject something because Luke is just telling us what's happening, not necessary, not necessarily what it means. And that's really, really, really important. We have to ask questions like, you know, why did he put this in here? What does other material of the Bible have to say? You know, is this good? Is this bad? What is, what is the, the epistles, the letters, the more the didactic teaching of Scripture have to say on this subject? It's very, very important. And, and I, maybe you've seen, if you've been a Christian a while, um, people get crazy with the book of Acts. You know, they pull out all kind of major doctrine from the book of Acts. There's doctrine there, but I would be very careful because it's a book of history. Early in the book of Acts, one of the, one of the things that we're going to talk about is about what it means to be spirit-filled, to be led by the Spirit, to be, to be empowered by the Spirit. And one of the things we have to look at and we have to be careful, again, is that Luke is two volumes, one book. So if we're going to say, what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit, we need to first start with Luke. Because who was it in Luke that was filled, empowered, on mission by the Spirit? His name was Jesus. Jesus was filled, was, was empowered by the Holy Spirit. John MacArthur writes this, The Holy Spirit was Christ's inseparable companion. From womb to tomb to throne, all activities in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, all activities in his life from his birth through his death through his resurrection until his ascension occurred in the full presence and by the full power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Luke tells us that the Spirit of God was present at his incarnation. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary. The Most High will overshadow you. Isaiah tells us that when Jesus would come, he'd be empowered by the Holy Spirit. He says the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding will rest upon him. The Spirit and counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord will rest upon him. Jesus, 30, about 30 years old, comes into public ministry. What's the first thing that happens? He gets baptized, and what happens? The Holy Spirit ascends on him like a dove. Do you know what happens next? He's driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4 says that when he came out of the wilderness, he was what? Filled of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.4, 4, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. It was the Spirit. Then he began his ministry in the synagogue. In the power of the Spirit, he demonstrated miracles, casting out demons, healing diseases. Jesus shows up what, it, what Jesus shows us was like to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led life. And so much so that Luke tells us that Peter stands up in Acts chapter 10 and says, talking about Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the key to understanding, which is a major theme of, this, uh, of Acts, the work and the power and the empowerment and the spirit-led life is Jesus, as we look at Acts, who would argue, who would argue that the greatest, most filled, perfect life of the Holy Spirit was in Jesus? So then we have to question, what about that guy? You know the guy. Hallelujah! You know, he's, he's that guy. Sweating, he's pouring out, and he's, he's healing, and he's, you know, he, he's, was that picture 
Is that, is that picture something that Jesus would look like? You know, his wife looks like she lost, you know, got hit in the head with a paintball gun. You know, that guy. You know, we have to ask that question. Luke paints for us a picture in, in verses 1 through 5 how the waiting disciples were, were, were waiting, who, who were, were given commands to wait for the filling of the Spirit so that they would look like Jesus and be empowered like Jesus on mission with Jesus. Wait, he says, don't do ministry without the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming. Look at verse 8. He will cause you to be like me and be on mission with me. Verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, ends of the earth. So Jesus loved by the power of spirit. Jesus lived by the power of spirit. Jesus did ministry by the power of spirit. Jesus lived on mission by the power of spirit. He engaged in spiritual conflicts by the power of spirit. He trained leadership by the power of the spirit. He obeyed his mom and dad as a little boy in the power of the spirit. Jesus went to the cross by the power of the spirit. Jesus was resurrected, Romans 8, by the power of the Spirit. Acts chapter 1, 1 and 2, it says that Jesus, all that Jesus began to do and teach. Look what it says. Very interesting, verse 2. Until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands, how? Through the Holy Spirit. Wasn't done. The resurrected Christ being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And his disciples are saying, wait. Wait. You will receive power. You will be my witness. 39 times, I think, Luke used the word witness. You will be my witness over and over. Now, don't raise your hands. I'm going to ask a question. Can we open a couple of windows if you're on the edge? Um, Please. Don't raise your hands. How many of us, okay, because I'm going to raise my hand first. How many of us are mostly or continually, most of the time, asking God for strength and power to get through the day? Lord, give me strength, give me power, because I'm ready to choke my boss. Lord, give me strength, give me power. I got this exam, and I didn't study very hard, right? Lord, oh, help me, please, as, as, I'm, as I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope with my kids, right? That's what we pray. Is anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. Lord, give me strength. But when was the last time we said, Lord, I'm leaving my house today? Empower me for the gospel. Empower me to be on mission with you. Turn that conversation around so that I could tell him about the good news of Jesus Christ. Empower me today, Lord, to open my heart, my mind, and my love for others so that I can see your hand, what you're doing. Empower me for that. That's what Acts is about. That's what I hope we're about. Praying for the Holy Spirit's power to declare the gospel with our co-workers, our fellow students, and our neighbors. Lord, fill me with power that I may boldly proclaim in love, not like a jerk, but in love, loving people and graciously telling them about you. Give me insight. That's the purpose and the work of the Spirit as he conforms us to the image of Christ, as he gives us strength for every day, is so that we can share the good news, be a witness So that great commission can be fulfilled. He wants to work in us. Be a witness to the glory of Christ and the transforming power of the gospel. Okay? That's my introduction. Now, just two quick things and we'll call it a day. We'll go to communion. Because you have to see this. Okay? And that's two things that kind of foundational to the book of Acts. We see in the first 11 verses. And that's the resurrection and the ascension. So if you're taking notes, just look at two things. Resurrection, and you guys could talk about this in your community groups this week. The resurrection and the ascension. The historical fact of both. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. He, Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by how many? Many proofs. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now the word proofs is not just simply eyewitness proof. It is the uh, the undeniable undeniable evidences in comparison to just witnesses. And what Luke is saying is, Jesus Christ rose from the grave and it's beyond dispute. Why would he write something like that? Even though Jesus was with them for 40 days, showed himself to over 500 people, ate fish with his disciples, still, like maybe some of you here in this room, did not believe. Even with eyewitness account, 
even with proof that's undeniably, they did not believe. To those people, and some people, they think the resurrection is just this superstitious belief that really some ancient person believed that we are much smarter today. But I'm here to tell you that if there's anybody on planet Earth in the day that Luke wrote Acts, which around 63 AD, if there's any people on planet Earth that would not believe that Jesus rose from the grave, it's the Jewish people. They either believe in one resurrection at the end of the age or no resurrection at all. That was their belief. So what would take Paul, the Pharisee, the hater of Jesus, the hater of Christians, to worship Jesus? To fall at his face and worship the king? I'll tell you what it was. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9, we'll get there. Jesus, the resurrected king, comes and knocks Paul clear off his horse. It's like, yeah, I'm alive. Oh, I didn't know. Well, you know now. That's what he says. Acts 9, you know what I mean? Knocks him right off. In Acts 26, when we get there in a couple of years, Acts 26, just kidding, Paul is a prisoner, and he goes before Hephaestus, uh, he's a king uh, of Syria, uh, of Caesarea, King Agrippa, and he goes before these two kings, and interesting, if you know anything about King Agrippa, he lived during the time of Christ's ministry, so he was around when Jesus was walking around Galilee. Here's Paul going before these two kings, they go like, Yo, let's bring this guy out, let's hear what he's got to say. Paul launches into this apologetic kerygma message all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 26, he says, the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he will proclaim light, both to our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying this in the defense, Festus said with a loud voice, King Festus, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. It's a historical fact. Verse 26 is key of chapter uh, 26 of Acts. For the king knows, Paul's talking to the king, the king knows, the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped your notice. For this was not done in the corner. See what he's saying? This is not about philosophy, king. It's not about my religious beliefs. It's not about my, my, my worldview. It's a reality. It's historical. It's subjective. It's, not obje it's objective, not subjective. The entire passage, if you read Acts 26, Paul's trying to say why he would never believe except it was for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he's alive and has completely changed my understanding of who Jesus is. It wasn't done behind closed doors. He says it was done in the open. It wasn't done in the corner. You know these things. You saw the tomb was empty. You heard the guards telling everybody it was empty. You know about the multitude of witnesses. Dude, you were there. You heard it just like I heard it, but I've seen him. And Paul's like, you know what? I had no choice. I didn't want to believe it. I fought against it. I persecuted and put people to death because of Jesus. But I was faced with the reality he's alive. He rose from the grave. I saw him. Deal with it, king. Festus, deal with it. I mean, think about it. If Jesus only resuscitated, beaten, whipped, torn, lashed, hung, crucified, laid in a tomb, 100, 500 pound, 1,000 pound rock rolled in front of it, and Jesus just happens to be able to remove the rock, come out, resuscitated, only to die again in, in a resuscitated body, like this, I'm God, worship me, I don't think that would happen. He comes back alive, resurrected, never to die again. You know what that tells us? You know what that tells us? His resurrection is proof positive that the greatest enemy that you and I have, which is death, is defeated. The resurrection tells us, we're going to talk about practicality, that sin was atoned for. Death is conquered. He rose from the grave. And for all those who believe and belong to Jesus through his work on the cross, we are guaranteed on the other side the everlasting love and arms of God because the resurrection has happened. The reality, it's historical is what Luke is saying. It's true. It has happened. The other thing I want us to see is the ascension. Turn to chapter 1, verse 6. 6 through 11. Let me leave it on the second slide. 6 through 11. Okay, look there in your Bibles, will you? Uh, we'll make this quick. Verse 3, Jesus talks about the kingdom. 
Verse 6, the, gap, the disciples get together and says, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I mean, they were still nationalistic, ethnic. They were still talking about Israel. They were still like, you know, when is the kingdom of God coming? Now, the kingdom of God is the reigning, ruling power of God in the world, making everything that's been broken right. We saw that with Jesus. He came into the world healing, forgiving sins, calming the seas, kind of putting everything back the way it was supposed to be before sin entered the world. Okay, and one day when he returns, by his reigning omnipotent power, it'll be put back permanently, eternally. And their question is more like, hey, when, when's Israel going to be restored? When is Jerusalem going to be ours? When is the Roman Empire going to fall? Jesus replies, verses 7 through 8, doesn't reject the premise that someday Israel will, will be restored, but it changes the whole focus of his mission. He's like, guys, listen, it's not for you to know. Times or seasons, verse 7, that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power. The Holy Spirit will come, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem. You'll be home. But you'll go to Judea, Samaria, and to the, all the world. Yes, God will come, but it begins in Jerusalem, goes to Samaria, and at the end, he will restore all things. And the last thing Jesus says, and somebody should call Harold Camping and tell him, is don't try to figure it out. Because, like, I don't even know in my, natural, in my, in my human nature, in my incarnation. Um, so don't try to figure it out. Just wait for power and be my witness. Uh, my father will take care of everything else. And, and then all of a sudden, in the midst of this question, he's like, you don't know. Don't try to figure it out. And all of a sudden, he descend, ascends. Like a kid with a balloon. You ever see that? And they're all looking up going, like, I'm never getting that back. <laughs> and there he goes. And they're all just standing there like, what the, you know what I mean? And then two angels show up, so that's helpful. What are you looking at? <laughs> like, never saw that before, you know what I mean? It's the first time, it caught me by surprise. No, you know, so, the same Jesus who went up, he's coming back. The same Jesus taken up will come back in the same way as you saw him going to heaven. What does that mean? I mean, you know, there he goes. Jesus is answering their question. When's the kingdom of God coming? And he just ascends. In other words, yes, the kingdom of God is, is now, but it's also not yet. Wait for the power. The, the, the kingdom of God will be spiritual reality, but it's not completely and not fully until I return. That's the answer to the question. And, and one of the things about Jesus' ascension you need to know is, is the exaltation. Jesus is not only ascends, but he's exalted in his ascension. The Bible says he is now at the right hand of God, Acts chapter 2. He exalted at the right hand of God. What does that mean? He's in the very throne room of God. Do you understand that? Jesus' ascension is his exaltation back to the place on the throne room of God. And it's already and it's not yet. That is majorly changes. That majorly changes fundamentally groundbreaking changes our relationship with God because of Jesus' ascension. And, and there's two ways. I think I have them both up here. Let me see. My PowerPoints are messed up today. Okay. Two ways. We'll get to First John in a minute. Two ways. One is, by Jesus' ascension, and I want you guys to talk about this, is we are guaranteed the permanent presence of God. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the grave, Mary grabbed him? The Bible says that he, she grasped him literally held on to him tight. And what does Jesus tell her? Mary, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But cling to me once I do. That's what he told her. Ascension means letting go of his hand, but getting him in our hearts. Okay? Letting go, don't cling to me. What he's saying to me is, listen, you can't take me everywhere you go. Even the bobbleheads on the front of the, you know, that don't count, right? Jesus like, you can't take me, everywhere, but if you let go of me and I ascend, you'll have more of me. And that's what Jesus is saying. I think it was Augustine who said, you ascend before our eyes and we turn back grieving only to find you in our hearts. The intimacy that we can receive and have received that permanent presence of God in our hardships, in our trials, in our difficulties, in all of life has radically changed 
our relationship with God. It's a personal intimacy with the creator God, the power of his spirit. We have not less of Jesus, we have more because of his ascension. Two, personal presence and also look, permanent propitiation. Okay, I know that's a big word. Jesus' ascension, Ephesians 1, says, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority and power and dominion, every name above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Jesus' ascension to the throne room of God is so important. It's not only the power that he received being at the right hand of God, but it is also the place of justice. You have to turn to 1 John 2. Jesus, John tells us, is our advocate. Look what it says. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's a seated on the throne with God in a place of power and authority and a place of justice, throne room, courtroom, think of it that way. And Jesus Christ the righteous, he's the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world of the whole world. Now, the propitiation means a place of appeasing wrath. It is the place of justice, and God poured out and satisfied his demands for justice on Jesus. And notice what it says. He's our advocate and because he's our propitiation. The word advocate means defense attorney, someone who comes alongside someone. Notice he doesn't say that Jesus is the merciful. He says Jesus is the righteous. Do you understand what that means? Because Jesus Christ has ascended to the Father and is seated on the throne. He can be our advocate. He doesn't go to the Father and say, Lou is a messed up dude, he sinned again, and therefore, God, I'm looking for a loophole, like most defense attorneys do, so that he gets off of your wrath, that he is somehow forgiven. And and Lord, please, just this one more time, Father, let Lou go and don't smoke him on the ground. That's not what Jesus is doing. He says he's the just, he is the righteous one. What Jesus is doing in heaven is saying, Father, Lou is guilty. He sinned, but I paid the price. The portfolio is the cross. And Father, it would be unjust for you to punish him for his sins when I already have been punished. It's not Jesus the, the, the arguer. It's not Jesus the, the, uh, the pleader. It's Jesus the advocate, propitiation, and Jesus the righteous one, the just one. Jesus is not in heaven demanding mercy but justice, and that's infallible case. That's an infallible case. He paid the price. Hebrews 7.25, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always, always, always lives to make intercession for them. Folks, catch this on the way out. Jesus' ascension means he is able to intercede before the throne of justice. Therefore, if there's any charge brought against us, he is our representative. John Piper said it this way, Christ is our attorney and his portfolio is our propitiation. He stands before his Father in heaven and every time we sin, he doesn't make a new propitiation. He doesn't die and atone for sin again. Instead, he opens his portfolio, lays the exhibition or the the exhibits of Good Friday on the bench before the judge, photographs of the crown of thorns, the lashing, the mocking soldiers, the agonies of the cross, and the final cry of victory, it is finished. That is the good news. That is the mission of the church. So folks, let me ask you as the band comes up, do you experience the personal presence of God through the power of his spirit? Do you know him intimately? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Have you repented of your sins and trusted in the atoning work of Jesus? Is he your advocate? Has he died for your sins? This table, that's what that represents. In some ways, the ascension, that he's seated on the throne where he is our advocate who died for our sins, past, present, and future. His body was broken. His blood was shed on the cross for your sins. That's the good news. That's all we have here at King's Chapel is Jesus. Sins forgiven, mercy given, 
Propitiation done. Do you know Jesus like that? We love you. We're here to tell you that good news. Jesus Christ really lived. He really ministered. He really died. He really rose from the grave. He really ascended to heaven. And he wants to be your advocate. Will you trust him today? And church, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's what, that's what Acts is all about, that mission. So be praying. Will you join him on his mission? Let's be used of God to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're new here, the band's going to play. We're going to sit in our seats for a few moments. We're going to be confessing sin, repenting of sins. And then when you're ready, we're going to celebrate. Come on up. Grab a piece of bread representing his body, a cup representing his blood, and celebrate the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. This table's for Christians. Maybe today's your first day of saying, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ today. You're welcome to the table. If you're here, you're just asking questions. We love you. We're glad you're here. Stay with us. Contact us. We'd love to talk to you more about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Father, it's all about Jesus. Thank you for sending your son, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you that he not only accomplished the work on the cross, rose from the grave and ascended and is seated right now alive and well on the throne, interceding for us. Lord, we pray that as we take communion, that we would be a people confessing and repenting sin, trusting in that work of Jesus. Lord, I pray for someone who's here that may not have trusted you and understand what it means to follow Jesus. I pray by your spirit, you would open their hearts and minds to help them turn from sin and turn to Jesus. Not simply because he, he is who he is, but because it's true he is what he is. He's done what he has done. We have eyewitness account. And the reality, he's alive and well today. So Father, we ask, please, open our hearts and minds to worship Jesus today. In Jesus' good name, amen.